Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Uh, this is an educational channel, and we take time to dig into some great theories of everything, ancient and modern, mostly obscure, um, you know, tour de forces and uh, cosmologies, magnum opuses, grand unified theories, uh, theories of everything that um, usually somebody dedicated their whole life or at least a few decades to the project and uh, in my opinion they hit a home run but uh, nobody's really paying too much attention and so uh, today is our hundred first video that we've done on the book called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha from Dr. Daniel Ingram. And uh, we are getting very close to the end here of this book. Uh, he's talking about um, his last retreat, I believe. And uh, he did many, many retreats uh, all over the world, a lot of them in the Far East. And... Um, took on meditation in very high dosages and kind of comments on, um, you know, the results, uh, mixed results, but, you know, very good results in terms of achieving what he set out to do and um, good results for the Buddhist maps uh, that they have drawn of the stages and states of consciousness that we can get into in these meditations. And so he's kind of just laying it out for us how if, if we want to get enlightened, um, he provides us with techniques and maps in order to do so and, and instructions in order to do so. And it doesn't matter what our religion is. They just happen to be Buddhist techniques. Uh, and it just so happens that the uh, very ancient civilizations over there in the Far East are quite advanced beyond where we are in terms of their spiritual acumen. And, uh, you know, it's not very surprising, I don't think. Um, so we can learn a lot from these... Uh, uh, these writings without, you know, becoming a, uh, you know, sycophant or some kind of uh, um, new age, you know, dabbler in these things, but we can uh, use them to our, you know, greatest ability for whatever, uh, however they fit into our own lives. So uh, let's start up here and see where Dr. Ingram takes us. I should mention something here about Sayadaw Upandita Jr. Uh, he was the person at this last retreat uh, who was kind of in charge of it. It was just great to have someone who wasn't impressed or intimidated by my abilities, but instead just kept his eye on the prize and stayed gently focused on that. He was perfectly fluent and comfortable with map theory uh, fluent and uh, and comfortable with deep concentration, didn't seem to care about the powers except as a diagnostic and teaching tool, and had an apparently unflappable steadiness to him in the face of all my descriptions of the wild and varied territory I found myself in during that retreat. My best advice, if you can find a teacher at that level, study with that one. There is much to be said for devotion to those worthy of devotion, which unfortunately is a pretty small number of teachers. But if you find a good one, an honorable one, an impeccable one, then de devote yourself to that teacher by studying well, listening to and applying what they say, and, pra and practicing with everything you have as it is likely to pay off. All these years later, the field has never destabilized again, the wobble never recurred, and things never unsynced. I knew when it happened that my Vipassana quest was over. 
I had the answer I sought, and it has held up. Event after event, challenge after challenge, cycle after cycle. There have been many interesting ways this insight has percolated through old patterns and relative issues. There have been many interesting shifts of perspective that have arisen from the, that integration process. However, getting that core insight in the first place is really the key point, the thing that made the difference I was looking for. And so hopefully this book will help inspire that in you, assuming you don't already have it, as you just might. If you do, good on you. I give great thanks to the thousands of practitioners over the millennia who have preserved and transmitted these teachings for those of us living today. May we do our best to live up to their standards and find ways to continue to realize and transmit the Dharma to those who come after us. Thus, the answers are in part one. As part one states, as the initial formal Vipassana instruction, to be very clear about all sensations and to perceive all sensations arise and vanish. That is the high Dharma that somehow hundreds of pages of this book come down to. It is that simple, at least from a Vipassana point of view. That is the profound beauty of the Dharma of the Buddha. It is excellent, straightforward, explainable, doable, immediate, based on very simple, clear hypotheses that are testable even early on in experience and continue to hold up all the way through to the end. That is the story, at least as far as fundamental insight goes. Since then, there has been much more to learn about the first, first two trainings, morality and concentration, particularly morality, the whole scope of relative skillful living in the world and optimizing value and meaning, which, as I said, is an endless and limitless undertaking. There is much to relate on that front beyond what is recounted here. But for the time being, this is hopefully enough to convey multiple practical Dharma points, chief among them being that while deep insights can be attained in this lifetime and they beat the pants off not having them, each of the scopes of the three trainings shouldn't be absolutely counted on to perf per uh, perfectly illuminate any of the others, even though they are definitely interdependent. All three trainings of morality, concentration, and wisdom are worthy of deep attention, study, and practice throughout our mortal mammalian lives. And uh, that's the end of the chapter. Chapter 71 is called More Practical Tidbits. Now that I have spelled out all that theory, explained all those techniques, and told some tales from the path, there are a few practical topics that I thought might help you the practitioner, put it together, and do something useful with it. These sections are in no particular order. These are topics that were not as easy to articulate until all that other business was taken care of. Uh, this section is called Describing Your Practice. It is easy to imagine, given all the terms for states and stages of the path that I've laid out here, that we could easily dive into the world of using these terms to shop talk about our practice with teachers, co-adventurers, friends, partners, and students, or at least those who speak in a lexicon like ours. Unfortunately, while it sounds easy in theory, it is not so in practice, as years of people attempting this has shown. Even in online communities that attempt a strong degree of standardization of terminology, we have learned again and again that people will still use word, words in radically different ways, assign different terms to similar experiences, map their own and other people's practices very differently, and, in general, often di diverge greatly from one another when talking about practice. Take a simple descriptor, such as bliss. For some, a subtle pleasant feeling may be bliss. Whereas another practitioner might not call something bliss until it is blowing their doors off. This gets worse the further we get from the bare phenomenology, or phenomenology of experience. By the time we are talking about profoundly deep concentration states and the world of awakening, 
the potential for misinterpretation is massive. So don't be afraid to ask polite, open questions about the specifics of how people use the terms they use to describe their practice, and try to use more clear descriptors in your own reports when possible. People will often judge their own practice and those of others based on totally different factors that are largely unrelated to the specifics of that practice. Reality testing shows again and again that those vying for power in a community are significantly more likely to disparage and undervalue the practice and accomplishments of their rivals subtly or overtly, regardless of the bare phenomenology. Similarly, those who wish to attract the friendship, approval, and even love of other practitioners are more likely to view their practice in a more favorable light, often leading to overstating attainments. Given that nearly everyone is subject to these sorts of distorting forces, assessment of relative levels of practice gets to be a very slippery business. Getting a straight read by a disinterested but skilled party is difficult, as there is almost always some degree of interest or agenda. Further, if we are talking with people who are not from our tradition or from a similar tradition that may diverge even subtly on the usage of the various key terms, as is common even within the major sects of Buddhism, then even the, pro uh, then the problems get magnified since not only are people likely to be waging some subtle or overt battle for their preferred definition of the term, they are less likely to appreciate anyone who is not a part of their core tribe of practitioners, leading to the perennial phenomenon of very accomplished members of different schools of practice misjudging the actual attainments of those of another school. So if you wish to have a deep, accurate, helpful, empowering communication about practice with any other practitioner, you are likely to have to first make sure the foundation of your relationship is on some mutually respectful ground. Take a lot of time to discuss and explain what any Dharma terms you use that you haven't already established as being well-defined between you, and politely agree to disagree on terms about which you can't come to terms or to, to, to some mutually acceptable definition. Also, when describing your practice and asking about that of another, the more you can stick to basic phenomenology over the use of more specific Dharma terms, the better. This can often take substantial time to establish, so if you wish to attempt deep Dharma con conversations that avoid the perennial quagmires of, that Dharma terms can create, be willing to spend hours and hours in conversation. Beware of assuming when you use a more advanced summary term that they will understand what you mean. Similarly, when they use an advanced Dharma term, be openly curious about what they mean rather than just presuming that you know exactly how they are using that term and what they mean by it, as this is a setup for trouble. It is not that deep Dharma conversations can't happen in short periods of time. They can. But there is nothing like having the time, willingness, openness, inquisitiveness, and respect for other people that allows for deeper levels of dialogue to blossom and grow. Bringing this back to this book, if you go on a retreat or are part of a Dharma community, be careful with using terms found here or in any other source until you have explored them deeply in your own practice and mutually establish with the people you are conversing with that you have come into a clear, explicit, and harmonious alignment regarding their meaning. Until that is mutually established, stick to very simple, straightforward, clear, ordinary, sensate terms to describe your practice. For example, don't say to a meditation teacher you don't know well, all right, just cranked it in the A&P and now plunging down into the third Vipassana jhana. That sort of thing will 
annoy most meditation teachers, even those used to this terminology. It has the potential for misinterpreting experience and thus misapplying terms is so large, particularly if you do something such as going on a three-month retreat at, say, Panditarama Lumbini. Don't be yet another one of those meditators who come, comes in spouting, spouting Dharma map terms, not following instructions, incessantly theorizing, quoting this or some other book to defend some intellectual Dharma theory point, and thus not grounding your mind in your sensate awareness and the true nature of experience again and again. Unfortunately, the first edition of this book created plenty of practitioners just like this. So try your very best to avoid being one of those. This second edition, while likely to contribute to that same problem, has tried to build even more specific sections to prevent this sort of misapplication of Dharma terms and concepts. I cringe inside when I recall the number of stories I have heard about impatient, disrespectful meditators who went on retreat with competent teachers, failed to heed the teacher's skillful practice instructions, failed to trust in the process, and failed to let the meditation and the organic process development of positive mental qualities do the work of moving them along the path rather than trying to force it with map theory. My sincere apologies to those teachers, such as Sayadaw uh, Vivekananda and many others too numerous to mention who have had to deal with this sort of obnoxiousness. I ask you to do your best to help support the view that people can use maps responsibly by using them responsibly yourself. Otherwise, you just reinforce the arguments of teachers who keep people in the dark about them. The more map theory you use, the less map theory you are likely to get from teachers who will naturally try to counterbalance your overemphasis on theory over practice. You want to get to those conversations someday? Prove yourself through very good practice. That leads to clear insights and describes those in very simple, straightforward terms. When on retreat, Practice according to instructions. Trust the process. Be at once an active practitioner and yet be grounded in the immediate moment. Some degree of patience and acceptance is required. Avoid fixation on future goals. If you find yourself swamped by Dharma theory and future fixation, reread the chapter, A Clear Goal. Take it to heart and implement what it recommends. Pay a lot of attention to the seven factors of awakening, making sure you have enough tranquility, concentration, and equanimity to balance investigation and energy. Rapture will help keep you in that moment. Be sure to carefully balance wisdom and faith. Specifically, instead of being some argumentative dharma, um, dharma term, uh, spouting brat, try, uh, oh, I see, Dharma term sprouting brat. Try, for the last few days, I have had lots of strong vibratory sensations in my body that were very pleasant and tingly in a delightful way. My breath has been very clearly composed of many fine sensations. Attention has felt very strong. Posture has been unusually straight and sustainable. I saw a bright white light that lasted about three minutes, about two sits ago, and now sensations are falling away, vague, and it feels like I am sinking into the floor, and yet it is cool and pleasant. And my posture has sagged somewhat, and energy is now significantly down from what, I w what it was. This way of describing practice is likely to go over much better with your teacher until you have established between you both what more advanced Dharma terms mean and that you both know how to use them in a way that skillfully matches the other person's understanding of theory. Further, when talking with people from very different traditions or those who are not Dharma practitioners or skilled in more technical language, simple descriptions of stages, will usually go over vastly better 
than those laden with lots of fancy Dharma terms or advanced phenomenology, particularly when it comes to unusual experiences. For example, when telling your non-practitioner partner about dark night experiences, ordinary emotional descriptions of what you are feeling, such as, I've been feeling much more afraid and anxious than usual. I apologize if I have been edgy and needed some reassurance from you that everything was okay. It is likely to go much better than, I entered stage six, saw an array of strange demons in my visual field, noticed a shamanic drum pulse with an emphasis on endings, got really paranoid, and then had a strange distorted vision of you in the arms of your ex-partner. I am not advocating for dishonesty, but for language that still conveys key points, which I can tell you leads to better outcomes for all concerned. And having typically gotten this wrong in my own life, I hope to pass on some hard-won lessons to those who come after me. How we describe our practice will also impact that practice itself. For example, let's say you decided to really take on the seven factors of awakening for a practice session. Just having that frame of reference will impact your practice. Describing your practice in those terms will also most likely have beneficial effects on your practice. For example, let's say you were doing a day-long sit with a meditation teacher and they directed each of the seven one-hour sits to focus on only one of the seven factors and then expected reports that emphasized its qualities. You are much more likely to get really good at identifying each of those qualities and then to balance and strengthen them because you are practicing that way and because you are expected to describe practice through that lens. Similarly, were you on a retreat where the noting technique was being used, describing your practice in terms of what you could note and how well you noted, it will help you frame your practice that way and likely help you get more out of the noting practice. For those who have been paying attention to the advanced um, nana and jhana based notation it can be used by skillful practitioners with additional qualifiers to explain what is going on in their practice and help identify those qualities in the practices of those with whom they are speaking about the dharma however just saying n11 j2 the second sub jhanic aspect of equanimity the 11th insight stage is it nearly as complete and informative as saying something like N11J2 that lasted about three hours during which I felt free as the wind and had this brilliant sense of effortless flowing transcendence in which I noticed lots of wonderful correlations between the mystical teachings of various traditions. I had a few lifelike visions of all my fellow Dharma practitioners glowing with the light of the Dharma like it was connecting them all together, all the while noticing flowing formations starting to become the clear predominant experience. Good descriptions can also help end the term wars over your uh, words such as jhana by similarly adding lots of descriptors that clarify what we mean. Saying I was in the first jhana is not nearly as clear as saying something like Finally, attention stabilized on the breath. My mind got quiet and being removed from the defilements, I was free to concentrate on the object, which occurred in nearly unbroken fashion, breath after breath, with a moderate degree of a seemingly steady, pleasant feeling in the body that gradually grew stronger as concentration deepened during the sit due to continued steady effort. This might be contrasted with some other description of the first jhana by a very strong practitioner inspired by the likes of those such as B. Allen Wallace or Ajahn Brahm, who set the bar for this first jhana extremely high. You might say something like, after three months of hard work on retreat for 16 hours a day, I finally entered the first jhana, meaning that the body was totally gone 
A bright white glow pervaded everything, and this stable, perfectly silent experience lasted four hours without wavering at all. Obviously, those are very, very different experiences conforming to radically different visions of practice, though both potentially in the vast territory of the first jhana. Clearly, what we call the first jhana can have many ways of presenting, depending on the strength of various factors and the emphasis of the practitioner and how they tune their mind. So long as we get comfortable with good descriptions, those of us who practice jhana and talk about jhana can all get along, or so I naively dream. Similarly, the maps of the territory of awakening, specifically the maps and boomies, the paths and boomies, involve terms to which various texts, traditions, practitioners, and teachers attribute wildly different criteria and ideals. If you are going to use these terms to describe some aspect of your practice, it is probably a good idea to clearly define what criteria you are using. I go way out of my way to define as clearly as I can the real world performance testing and characteristics of the way I use those terms for various stages of practice, such as the perennially controversial term arahant. But this degree of specificity is not yet common, though I hope one day it will be. So if you encounter someone who is using a term about their practice that you are sure you know the correct and only possible definition of, try keeping an open mind and asking them exactly what they mean by that term. Language is a tool for communication, uh, to communicate ideas, and in this case, ideas to try to promote good practice in those hearing them. Language does a lot better in this role than in the role of a battleground of territory to defend. Try to model this skillful metacognitive wisdom when discussing the language of the Dharma. Okay, this section is called Dependent Origination Revisited. It can be fun to revisit topics and put them together in ways that weren't as easy before a lot of theory was established and defined. And dependent origination is one of those topics. To refresh, the 12 links of dependent origination are death, aging, sickness, pain, lamentation, grief, and despair all depend on birth, which depends on becoming, which depends on clinging, which depends on craving, which depends on Vedana. Uh, don't remember what that means. V-E-D-A-N-A. -A. Uh, it's either Pali or Sanskrit, which depends on sense contact, which depends on the six sense doors, which depend on name and form, which depend on consciousness, which depends on volitional formations, which depend on ignorance. If you have gotten to this point in the book without reading the section earlier in part five that explains all that, it's probably best to go back and read that now unless you are already well-versed in dependent origination. The further along we get into that list, the harder it is to understand. Similarly, you can line up many Dharma teachings with the various levels of dependent origination, and you will find that those address the beginning of the list are much more accessible than those that address uh, links toward the end of the list. You will also be able to get some sense of your own practice and its depth by the degree to which you are able to perceive for yourself the truths being pointed to at the level of each of the 12 links. For example, many beginning teacher teachings start with topics such as 
ordinary suffering, loss, death, pain, conflict, and the like. Everyone can understand what is being talked about, as these are straightforward aspects of life. Earth is also straightforward. However, terms like becoming make a lot more sense if you have had experiences of past lives in your practice. And talking about these to people who haven't had those experiences often ends in frustration. Okay, we're going to stop it right there. And I uh, believe we will finish this book tomorrow, um, with, uh, hopefully. And um, so come back tomorrow, catch the end, and we'll move into something else. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a great day.